Okay, welcome to the second part of the video. We're going to pick off, pick up right where I left off. Um, we're going to be still talking about this cell membrane, and um, we're just going to reiterate the two purposes of these proteins right here. Um, one, they make aqueous filled channels, which are water filled channels, um, and are selective to what they pass through. So, like we said, some only allow potassium to come through, some only allow sodium to come through. Largest molecule to pass through these channels are a glucose molecule. So it's kind of protective because larger uh, molecules or more damaging molecules we don't want to get in the cell. It's kind of a protective mechanism for it to not get into the cell. <clears throat> if somehow we got damaged or we're sick and we let certain, certain substances within the cell, that's how the cell can become damaged and so forth. Number two, the intracellular environment is regulated by these proteins. So within the cell, this cell environment is regulated by these proteins. The extracellular environment, the outside of the cell, external environment, is regulated by the kidney. So we talked about before with the drawing of the cell membrane charge and in its polarized state, um, muscle cell tissues are about negative 70 <clears throat> millivolts. And we talked about how the negative, an an negative anions that are within the cell stay there. So as we pump the potassium out, it's naturally more permeable. The cell is naturally a negative, is negative on the inside. So what is capacitance? The capacitance means the ability of a membrane to hold a charge is called capacitance. If we move more positive ions from the inside of the membrane to the outside of the membrane, we become what's called hyperpolarized. So here we have negative 70 millivolts because we naturally are leaving those anions behind and positive potassium ions are going to the outside of the cell. Now, if we move, let's just say, more positive ions from the inside to the outside of the cell, we become hyperpolarized. Ultimately, what does that mean? That means we are even more negative. So this can go from negative 70 down to, say, negative 90 or negative 100 millivolts. So what does that mean with regards to the stimulus which has to act on the cell in order for it to get it to respond? The stimulus will have to be much more powerful. So if we become hyperpolarized, we need to hit the cell harder with an even harder stimulus from our nervous system. The cell is also influenced what's called by electrical gradient. Um, not just this concentration gradient of the sodium potassium difference. The electrical gradient opposes the movement down the concentration gradient. So there's a force that's going to impu impede the movement of sodium inside the cell. There's an electrical hold on some particles within the top of the membrane. We need this electrical potential to be there so resting membrane potential can be what it is. So these channels can do their job. So there's also an additional electrical hold along the top here and not just the concentration difference between the two. But that's those two things, the electrical charge as well as this chemical gradient is what determines our cell to be polarized at negative 70 millivolts. When we're talking about conductance, conductance refers to permeability, so permeability of that cell membrane. This is related to the number of channels open. So the more channels we have, what are we doing? We're widening the gradient. That makes sense. So now we have three things influencing resting membrane potential. One, those concentration gradients, which are the difference between sodium and potassium, as well as we have the anions and the chloride ions. That electrical gradient that puts a hold on that cell membrane. And as well as now is the permeability. The more channels we have open, the wider the gradient and the ease of movement of ions going in and out of the cell is much more efficient than if we were to only have a couple channels open. So if we combine the electrical component, the concentration gradient, and take into consideration the permeability, this is what gives us our driving force. Uh, there are actually ways to calculate this electrical potential called a Nernst potential, but that's outside the scope of this class. We're not going to be doing that this semester. So when talking about the permeability of the cell, <clears throat> The number of channels are going to determine two things. One, the rate of movement, and two, the ease of movement. 
the more channels you have, the faster the movement will be and the easier it will be to move those ions in and out of the cell. So that makes sense. More channels that are open, easier for ions to get in and out of the cell versus just having a few open. On the cell membrane itself, there are about 20 potassium channels for every one sodium channel. So it's about a 20 to one ratio. Okay, so here is a good graph um, that's gonna be depicting an action potential and if a cell is going to respond or not. So action potentials are really the electrical conduit through which we wanna transmit a signal. So we just pretty much want to be transmitting one action potential to the next to continue the cell, this signal from cell to cell to cell to cell, all at a very, very rapid rate because why do we want to contract all as one together? So the speed of which this occurs is very, very fast. So in order for an action potential to develop, the stimulus that impacts on that piece of excitable tissue has to be of a given intensity. So you see right here, we're at rusting membrane potential at negative 70 millivolts right here. And then we have negative 55 right here, which is for this example is threshold. So we have to hit this cell with at least 16 millivolts for this or the cell won't respond. So the, the strength has to at least be 16 millivolts right here for this cell to even respond and generate an action potential. Anything between negative 70 and negative 55 millivolts will be called passive depolarization. The stimuli will go up a bit but then come back down, meaning the cell did not respond since it didn't get to threshold. So the cell will not respond to those little um, hits that it took. It needs to be at least 16. Okay, so when we talk about the stimulus that has to hit the cell, a strong stimulus causes the cell to become less negative. So if we hit this, this cell with a strong stimulus, this cell will become less negative and then it will turn to positive. So what does the stimulus do? So when the stimulus acts upon the cell membrane, we're going to cause more sodium channels to open, becoming less negative. And because sodium is a positive ion, the more positive ions that rush into the cell, that's why we're going to becoming less negative and become more positive because sodium, again, is a positive ion. So when we get to threshold, we're going to open as many sodium channels as we possibly can, and then we'll have that upstroke of depolarization right here. This is depolarization. When we go above zero here, and then we can go to plus millivolts sometimes, depending on how hard that stimulus was. And then we're gonna talk about repolarization next. But once again, a strong stimulus causes the cell to become less negative, causing those sodium channels to open on the membrane. It's the only way we can become less negative. We need to move something positive into the cell, which is sodium. So when we get to threshold, we're going to open as many sodium channels as we possibly can, and then we will have that upstroke for depolarization. And then that's where we can transmit one signal to the next. So when we go above zero again, we can go up to positive 40. Okay, so after we depolarize the cell and send that electrical signal through, we need to repolarize. So what does repolarization mean? Ultimately, ionic correction. We need to come back to baseline because we need to get ready for the next stimulus. So we've depolarized. We have depolarized, but we really need to repolarize so then we can come back to baseline and get ready for the next stimulus and keep exercising and keep um, contracting and, and transmitting those signals. So what we're going to do is we're going to stop the influx of sodium, we're going to shut those channels down and get rid of a lot of a positive thing, which will give us now this downstroke. So here we're going to shut off those sodium channels and now we are not letting any more positivity coming in. We are going to fire up with the sodium potassium exchange pump even faster and we're going to pump out all of those sodium ions that caused the cell to be positive, we're going to pump it outside the cell. And now we're going to become more negative again. We're going to drop back down. We're also going to move a lot of potassium out because again it's 50 to 100 uh, times more permeable to potassium than sodium, so we're going to be moving all this potassium out, which is also positive. 
So we're moving all the sodium and potassium back out of the cell, becoming much more negative. But what happens is we actually get rid of more potassium than we need right away. So we have what's called an undershoot here. So this is where we become hyperpolarized, is what I was talking about before. So this looks like maybe possibly negative 100 millivolts at this point. And now we're going to talk about this refractory period. So this undershoot, again, represents us being hyperpolarized. We have overcorrected and now have an even greater inside negativity than we did at resting membrane potential. So we're even more negative. So how quickly we repolarize determines how quickly we can respond to the next stimulus. If we were to repolarize very, very slow, we wouldn't be able to respond to the next stimulus in order for us to contract or transmit the action potential from one cell to the other. But before we can respond to the next stimulus, we need to put back all of the ions where they came from, which is what we just went over. So that repolarization is representing a state of refractory, and we have two refractory periods. One, we have an absolute refractory period, and we have a relative refractory period. So let's first talk about this absolute refractory period, which on this graph here actually technically starts once we hit, once we start depolarizing. Once we become a threshold, that's what starts our absolute refractory period actually as we're depolarizing. But this is a point in time of repolarization where no matter how strong a stimulus is, the cell will not respond. Not enough, ultimately what it means is not enough ionic correction has taken place in this period. So sodium potassium isn't pumped out of the cell yet. It's still too much, too much positivity. The cell is not going to respond to any sort of stimulus. Again, this period actually begins as soon as you start the upstroke of depolarization. So the absolute factory period is once we're in this period right here, no matter how hard of a stimulus from the nervous system comes into that cell, it's not going to respond because not enough ionic correction has taken place for it to respond again. Now moving to this relative refractory period right here. This is a point in time where enough ionic correction has taken place and if the stimulus is of supra threshold intensity, the cell will then respond. The response will not be as strong as the first stimulus because, again, we're still trying to make that ionic correction, so it's not going to be as strong as that first stimulus response. The action potential won't be as high. It will be slower, but you can still get a response from the cell if you hit it with an extremely high stimulus. It takes a lot more of a stimulus because, again, we become hyperpolarized. This is right here. This is when this period starts. We're becoming hyperpolarized. So that's what I was explaining before, when we're hyperpolarized, that stimulus that comes in has to be of supra threshold intensity for us to actually respond. So down here, when we're hyperpolarized, let's say we're at negative 90 now instead of negative 70, is that 16 millivolt stimulus that hit the original one that caused it to respond? Will that cause it to respond? No. It has to be negative 90 to negative 55, it's got to be at least 36 to hit, so in order for it to go a millivolt. So that's why the stimulus has to be of supra threshold intensity. Okay, so in our next video, we're going to continue this discussion of transmembrane action potentials and start talking about synapses next and how there's two different synapses where there's electrical synapses and chemical synapses. We're mainly going to be talking about in this class a chemical synapse, but I'm going to give you a couple of the differences in the next video.